and more in the education space, we're seeing that grant funders want to know two things. One, upfront, who's done this work that you're doing um, now before? And, um, you know, what is what does research tell us about whether or not it's proposed to be successful? And then if you're going to pilot something or continue a program, what measures will you use to know whether you're successful? Hello, hello, hello. It's Holly Rustic here with Grant Writing and Funding, and I'm here to help you grow capacity, increase funding, and to advance mission. And to help me do that this week, Kara and I are going to be talking about the evaluation section in your grant and really looking about your action plan and your action theory. So I have Kiara Del Tito Sharat here on the Grant Writing and Funding podcast. So welcome so much. And you're also in the mentorship. So I'm super excited that you're here and we're going to be talking about grant related things today. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. That was such a wonderful and enthusiastic welcome. It's my pleasure to be here. I love it. I love it so much. And just to give a little background, you've been writing grants, especially in the education sector and, sec you know, for so long now. And also you've been able to raise over $26 million in grant funding uh, for schools and nonprofits. And you have a goal. I love your goal. It's like a hundred million dollars by 2030, right? Is that the right goal? I love it so much because it is, it's on. <laughs> you're doing it. Yeah, I figure, you know, why not be ambitious? Um, and I think it's actually doable. So oh, yeah. let's hit the ground. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You're already over a quarter of the way there and you've got time and you're, you're doing it right. So working with a lot of different uh, nonprofits and schools in your business, CDS Education Consulting. Um, so you've been able to really spread the word. You're also doing more webinars now, and you're really getting the word out on how your agency operates to provide these grant services. So thank you so much for the work you do, because there are there we need more and more grant writers out there, especially to focus on these very specific fields. Like I imagine you do a lot of like um, a Department of Education grants and that sort of thing, as well as other types of grants. But is that kind of in the federal lane is kind of where you like to be? Yes, absolutely. Um, so mostly Department of Education grants if, when I am supporting organizations. Um, on the federal side, there are often some tie-ins um, to some other agencies, but generally, you know, if my client is the lead, it's a Department of Education grant at the um, federal level and also many Department of Education grants um, for individual states here as well. I love that so much. Yeah, because there's really a need, you know, and I've worked with a lot of universities as well on grants and with DOE grants and that sort of thing. And there's there's so much grant funding out there um, that is available, right, for not just uh, school, public schools, but also charter schools, also nonprofits that have schools or do education programs. So is that kind of like where you're tapping into a lot of the grant funding as in a variety of um, clients? such as that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think of education really broadly. Um, and so it's everything from, you know, I have a client that actually works in the juvenile justice system and they're thinking about interrupting the um, school to prison pipeline. And that's one way they're nice. thinking about, about education. I have some clients that work more in the um, uh, touching on health and human services and early childhood um, learning, expanding in particular the Montessori model um, to more youth across um, the country. And then I have also clients doing um, creative pipeline work. I have a couple of schools that I work with that are thinking of building um, new programs to start educator training while youth are still in high school um, so that they can, you know, not only advance the education uh, pipeline, but also um, help those individual students to go to college for free and to do it in an area that will make a difference. so much and just kind of because you're in the space of DOE Department of Education right like, yeah through there has there been like when I was looking at research it seemed like through the pandemic they really started pushing a lot of federal funds more so than they had before through DOE and for yeah. good reason there was a lot going on with mm -hmm. having to provide computers now for kids who were learning at home temporarily and all of the things but have you seen that funding continue um as we're settling more into 2023 right now 
Yeah, it's a great question. And it's definitely something that's on the top of my mind. Um, as of now, most of those funds need to be spent by the end of 2024. Okay. Um, in a few cases, there are some pieces that go out until 2026, but the vast majority are by the end of 2024. So this is a place where I really encourage schools in particular, but also nonprofits that have relied on some of that funding um, to really be thoughtful about sustainability. Um, because in many cases, you know, that wasn't just $10,000 grant that was, you know, 500,000, a million dollars that was coming to a school or organization um, that they need, really need to think about, okay, am I going to sustain these staff members that I brought on new programs that I did? If so, am I going to create a new fee-for-service program to fund that? Am I going to look for additional grants and really just making sure there's not that drop off, not that fiscal cliff yeah. that happens um, once, you know, around August, 2024 hits okay. um, at and the same time. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. But are, are there still funds though that are allocated that have not been funded yet? So can they still get in and tap in some of those? Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so largely a lot of those funds are at the state level now. So the federal okay. government gave funding um, to the states and the states are allocating them according to their plans. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really widespread. So many or many schools got um, an initial uh, amount by formula based on the number of students they have and their student need and those things. And now a lot of states are working through a reserve of competitive funding for different projects that that they're interested in. A lot of them still around learning acceleration coming out of the pandemic, but mm -hmm. also, um, you know, thinking about spaces creatively, outdoor learning, um, uh, partnering with um, peer schools around professional development and other pieces. So kind of rethinking education to not just, um, you know, meet the need that exists now, but really go beyond that and accelerate learning. Mm -hmm. And is that kind of prioritize that out of the box thinking right now with some of these grants? I think so, definitely. Um, you know, most states made a bet uh, about a year ago on the ways that they were going to spend mm -hmm. those funds and their offices are now kind of putting them out there. Here in Rhode Island, it's been really interesting because some of those pockets of money are just truly enormous. So there's an outdoor learning grant um, opportunity, for example, where the state can fund 70 projects at um, $100,000 each. And we're a tiny state. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's 50 something LEAs. Everyone could potentially get funded if they put in a high quality application. Wow. So that's really unprecedented um, for what we've seen here in the past. And most states have something comparable, if not more yeah. um, than we do here. Even here in Guam, we have um, a lot of funding going through the Economic Development Authority for after school programs. So they're really getting funding here as well. And it's up to $100,000 per organization. And we're just a small island, right? So there's a lot of amazing programs that are being developed because of this funding. So yeah, definitely I like that out of the box thinking. I know even here, they're really like thinking more about like technology as well. They're prioritizing mm -hmm. some um programs that deal with technology or just island wisdom or like connecting to roots and sustainability and that sort of thing as well. Right. So yeah, I think that people are rethinking like what the, what it looked like pre-COVID and mm -hmm. now like we're in this after space where yes, people are going back to in-person and all of that, but I think there's still an element of creativity that it Absolutely. maybe grants, grant funders are looking at and saying, hey, try that out. Let's see what that looks like. You know what I mean? They're they're, they're having a little more leeway maybe with clients to try some new things. Yeah, I think so, definitely. Um, and you make a really, really great point that, yes, it could be through a state department of education, but it also can be through a municipality or yeah. state government separately. Um, and that's the place where I often see um, right now a lot of funding for our collaborating nonprofit organizations. So maybe it's not the school that's going for that funding because they have the Department of Ed funding, yeah. but, you know, your higher ed um institution or you're a local nonprofit that does after school support or career counseling or whatever it may be. Um, and you know the municipalities here also have that kind of influx of cash in a way that they haven't in the I past. love that. So for you guys listening or watching, like there 
there's definitely still money out there for these types of education programs, whether you're a nonprofit, or school, whatnot, but tapping into those and knowing where to find them, right, as well. Like, that's the thing. It's like, here on Guam, like, if you didn't know that it's happening through the right GITA, the Economic Development Authority, then you might not be aware of those fundings available, et cetera. So like having you then be able to work with you so you can identify where those fundings are and where the funding is, and then also to know how to realize what is that priority for that funding source? How do we shape that project? So I kind of want to talk about that now. You talked about evaluations, right? And kind of tying into like, why is it important to have an evaluation section in a grant, especially when we're looking at these types of grants, um, so you can score higher, like, so your project is more successful? Like, what are some of the reasons why we want to focus on that section of a grant? You know, is it where you find people are kind of lacking, maybe? So can you kind of talk to that as well? Absolutely. I think it's all, all of the above in terms of the things that you just mentioned. Um, so more and more in the education space, we're seeing that grant funders want to know two things. One, upfront, who's done this work that you're doing um, now before? And, um, you know, what is what does research tell us about whether or not it's proposed to be successful. And then if you're going to pilot something or continue a program, what measures will you use to know whether you're successful or not? Um, over the last, you know, five or six years, um, the requirements in particular from the federal government um, and trickled down to states through other public funding have really made um instead of having a high quality education evaluation plan being like an added bonus that gives you those extra points at the end, it now is something really foundational that in many cases becomes like a gatekeep. Um, so they're mm -hmm. checking that those things are clear first before they're going into, um, you know, the depths of your program specifically. Wow. Um, so I think, you know, really knowing that um, you have an understanding of what a funder is looking for, both in terms of prior evidence of mm -hmm. success or a theory that your project will work. And then also um, they want to know that the investments that they're making um, are yielding change. And so they really want to see, OK, what are you actually looking at as a measure of that change um, and how formally or informally are you looking at those pieces? Mm -hmm. And I love that because, you know, a lot of what we talked about here and before is like, oh, we're trying out new things too. Like, and I like how you said it doesn't necessarily have to be like case studies, but as long as you can have like, like theories as well, right, that you can prove and you can point to, and that can be really good. So if you are starting something new, absolutely. And then also knowing like, well, what are we going to evaluate? It's not like, oh, we'll just start it and see. It's like, you still have to understand what your measurements will be, Right. Um, and, and understanding that is where I see it get, a lot of people get hung up in a grant. Like they're like, I don't know. I just said I was going to do this stuff and how do I evaluate it? It gets done. <laughs> so can you kind of talk to that? Like, of, what does that even mean? Absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think every organization that I've worked with handles this a little bit differently mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. because I have a background in education policy and that's my niche. Um, you know, I do a lot of work thinking through a theory of action and linking evaluation metrics back to that with clients. In some cases or other grant writers, whether the be the business or the grant writer themselves might decide, you know, we have someone on staff that does our evaluation plan. Here mm -hmm. is, you know, the packaged evaluation plan we're going to give you. That's what we're going to do. Or um, there might be something most organizations have at least a broad understanding of, you know, these are my outcomes and these are the tools and measures that we already have in yeah. place. Mm -hmm. um, I work really hard with my clients to make sure that whenever possible, they're not creating a new um, evaluation tool just just for the sake of a grant, because that yeah. adds, um, you know, a tremendous amount of burden in terms of the work that they have to do. Mm -hmm. um, but it might be implementing or applying a tool that they're already using or data that they're already collecting in a different um, way, um, or for, you know, a specific subset of the people that they serve, because that's who the grant is going towards mm -hmm. um, supporting. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So whenever they can, it's like, yeah, you got to show like what this grant's going to do. But if you already have a tool of how to evaluate something, even if you have to tweak it a little bit or come up with, a, pull out a certain amount of data, then you can utilize that. And I love that. Yeah. Use what you already have. So you're not 
recreating and and sometimes it can be simple right like evaluation it can be simple it can be looking at surveys and um you know our our lists like sign up lists if you have an after school program how many people attend it a roster right it's like sometimes we think evaluation and we go academic instead of like mm-hmm. uh, tangible right so can you kind of talk to that yeah, as well? no th- yeah, I think that's a great point. So I think this it's this difference between um, outputs and outcomes, right? So mm-hmm. sometimes funders are interested um, with your outputs, the tangible things that happen as a result of um, implementing your grant. So like you said, how many people signed up for the session that you offered? Um, you know, how many lectures did you create or how many, um, you know, meals did you provide? These really kind of clear metrics that we can look at that have to do with what you did. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. some funders are more interested in the outcomes, which are as a result of providing those meals or giving those lectures or having those sign up. What change did you see um, for the constituents that you serve or for the broader community? Um, largely, you know, we see that the um, smaller private grants, uh, smaller corporate grants tend to um, skew more on the side of that anecdotal outputs, just want to know that you're committing and following through with the funding um, Mm -hmm. that they gave you. And as you get towards the um, state and federal side of things, we see this escalating scale of really needing to provide um, an evaluation plan that is that kind of academic research that you're talking about. Um, Because for Department of Education, I would say that all of their grants, um, to a certain extent, do want to create some kind of proof point as a result. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, um, no matter what, even if it's a baseline kind of evaluation, the minimal would be, you know, that survey changes over time or um, a test changes over time, which just like what we call descrip- uh, excuse me, descriptive statistics. You know, what happened as a result for your population, core data, not an analysis, not trends, just kind of like what went in and what came out. Yeah. Um, and then many, many of the, um, of the federal grants will also then want that more formal program evaluation. So a statistical analysis of um, not only what happened uh, after you did the program as a result of, uh, as it varied from what was before, but can we actually say that your program was responsible for making those changes or could some other factor be contributing to that? Yeah, and and I love that because it shows then too, there's so much more impact and involvement from that grant, right? When we look at outcomes, and you put it so eloquently, so many people get hung up, outputs, outcomes, like the difference. So you did such a good way of explaining like outputs, measurements, tangible, right? Data and outcomes that change, right? So it's like, and, and you know, getting kind of like, okay, how do I how do I really show that? And, and a lot of times it, it's, it's a little bit difficult. And that's why you need to have that kind of evaluation tool in place. So you understand even how you're going to track, what does change look like? What does impact look like? Right. Those things are a little bit harder in a way. Well, it depends on your tool, right? You have to have the tool in place so you can really show it, but it takes a little more thinking, I think, and a little more organizing and planning to be able to say, what is the true impact? What is the behavior, educational or learning changes um, and measuring those things? So I love that you're really touching on that. And that's where your expertise lies because it's really hard for so many grant writers to really wrap their heads around that and to say, well, how do I really show that? And just to say, instead of just saying, oh, um, the community improved their whatever, you know what I mean? Like they kind of throw out a blanket statement. So how can you get away from blanket statement, right? How can you do that? Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, So there's a tool that many grant writers are probably familiar um, with, but it's called a logic model. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially um, a graphic representation of your theory of action. So because you do one thing, you expect something else to happen. And it really walks you through what are the inputs? What are the things that you're coming into a process 
with? What are your activities? So looking in your grant application, what are all those different commitments you said that you are going to make? Um, and then what outcomes do you expect to see as a result of um, those activities? And then from there, you know, what change yeah. um, do you expect to happen, both in terms of like on your individual participants, but then like on society or over time um, for your community? Um, not all grants require that a logic model is something that is um, submitted with them. Many of the federal um, grants and state grants will, but not many of the um, smaller uh, private grants will. But um, as a grant writer, that's often um, where I start with my yeah. clients. So if I have an initial meeting with them to understand their program, um, it's not always formal, but I kind of have my pen in hand and I'm drawing out what this looks like um, for me. And so, um, because if I don't understand it, I can't um, describe it to somebody right. else. And so really understanding, you know, what is that through line of your program? Is it tying back to your mission? All of those pieces. And then I looked, I used that logic model too, to look at my outcomes and make sure that the things that I'm saying I'm going to measure in my evaluation plan are directly linked to the outcomes that I'm looking for. How will I know if I met that outcome mm -hmm. or not? And I also use the logic model um, for my objectives and my activities so that, you know, I can go through and make sure that all of those things are referenced clearly in the grant application. Because when you have a big, big project, sometimes it's easy um, to forget, you know, a sub-step here or there, especially if you're really deep and embedded in the work, you might think it's implied. Whereas, um, you know, sometimes people need a little bit more information and yeah. need you to walk through um, things a little bit more clearly. I love that. And I love like a lot of people I, that I know as grant writers, they'll work like you work on the logic model first, right? Because especially if you're working with a team, you need like everybody to be on the same, right? And same page. And then they'll put the logic model like next to their computer while they're working on the grant just to stay connected and on track, right? And I was like, I love that so much because it is, it's this one page. And like you said, um, even when you submit it in the grant, it's nice because it gives grant reviewers the ability to kind of have, because it's a one page kind of diagram mm -hmm. table, right? It's a picture, it's a visual representation. So it also breaks up dense text of you trying to explain yes. all this stuff, like which you're going to do anyways in the grant application. Let's be real, right? You're going to reset, say a lot of those things, but to have a one page image, it reinforces that and it's easier than for the grant reviewer to score you well. Yeah. <laughs> They'll understand, right? So Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know it's something you've talked about before in the podcast and in the mentorship, but like keeping that lens of a human being is going to be reviewing this yeah. application. What makes it easy for them with their rubric in hand to be able to see whether you're checking off those individual pieces. And I do think that diagrams and charts, whether they be the logic model or just organiz organizing data into a table or whatever it may be, if it's allowable, can really communicate a lot in a yeah. little bit of space and do so in a really kind of clear and straightforward way. I love this. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise on specifically even DOE and federal grants and how to kind of frame this because a lot of people it might feel like, oh my gosh, that is just another level or it can't wrap my brain around. So thank you for breaking it down so like step by step. And you know, people out there, if you guys are really looking for someone to help you out with those types of grants, here's Kiara. <laughs> you definitely want to, you definitely want to um connect with her at CDS Education Consulting because that's what you guys specialize in. That's what you're doing. You've already brought in over 26 million. You're on your way to 100 million. So if you guys want to be a part of that, <laughs> then definitely contact you. So, but before we give people where to contact you, I just want to talk about the mentorship program too, because you're also in the grant professional mentorship. Um, and you just started a couple months ago. So this is awesome that you are a part of that too. And, and building your business and building your agency so you can really scale and take on so many clients out there that need your services. Um, so I just wanted to kind of ask you, like, what's been your experience with the mentorship so far? Um, the mentorship's been really wonderful for a number of reasons. Um, in particular, it's been a great space to um, ask questions, uh, kind of kind of without judgment, talk with peers um, that are doing this work. 
Um, and to, it's a really respectful community where everyone's kind of at a different stage of implementing their um, grants business. Um, but we it doesn't mean that we don't um, grapple with common challenges. And so thinking through everything from, you know, what's a digital tool that you use that, you know, helps to make your time um, more optimized to, you know, here's this RFP that came out, you know, does anyone have experience with this particular funder or this particular agency? So um, that's been really helpful. I think also um, one exercise that was really meaningful for me was one that we worked on early um, in the program together, thinking through packaging mm -hmm. um, and our goals for um, the year and really thinking about that in terms of who we are as individuals and our lifestyle that we're aiming to have and, you know, what does it mean in terms of the ways that we want to work and how much funding we want to take in? Because I think oftentimes um, those pieces are thought about separately and not um, not t in tandem with each other. And so that was a really meaningful um a really meaningful activity that actually did make me go back and think through, you know, what did my packages look like? How do I streamline some of this um, and really make it so that, you know, I can continue to um, be really happy with the amount of time that I'm spending in my work and the flexibilities that I have while still feeling like I'm making an impact. I love that so much. Yeah. And I know like um, we were talking too, and you said, yeah, I, I got clear on my more clear on my packages and what I actually I'm putting out there. So it's not when people come to me, I'm just kind of like creating something completely from scratch, but I, I already have something prepared that then I can just augment or customize to that person. So it's not, it takes less time for me. And then you kind of step into it with a more professional space that this is what I do. Can you kind of talk to that a little bit? Cause I know maybe there's some grant writers out there who are like, how do I do this? I'm always like creating something completely new for every single discovery call that I'm on. Absolutely. So when I first started, um, every time I priced out um, a piece of work for a client, I was doing it on an hourly basis. And I was thinking through, you know, with the client, if they had, um, if they were new and we were thinking about ways that we could work together, I would say, well, I could do prospect research for you. I can do um, writing grants. I can charge you this per this individual grant, et cetera. Um, what I've really moved towards is thinking about standard pricing for, you know, a foundation grant costs this much, a, a um, state grant, a federal grant for me. And I also work on new school applications in particular charter schools. So if it's a new charter school, how much is that going to cost to put together the proposal or an expansion of an existing school Um and really kind of having that plug and play menu ready for me. It's not mm -hmm. that those things need to be completely static. Of course, right. there's always going to be some Absolutely. variation, but at least, you know, there's some set guidelines. And I think that does a few things. It makes the process clearer and mm -hmm. and um, more, more easy in terms of negotiations, but it also is more equitable for your clients. So you know that, you know, you're charging um similar clients a similar amount for similar work that you're doing as opposed yeah. to kind of doing that on the fly. I also find that, um, and this aligns well to some of the conversations you've been having this month, like it makes me pause and stop before offering that deep discount. Right. If I think about, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> if I think about, you know, um, well, how much did I charge the last time I did a similar piece of work? And oh, actually that was quite a bit of work. So maybe I shouldn't, you know, give that 25% discount unless there's really, really a motivation for what that would look like in terms of the long-term relationship that we have. Because ordinarily, you know, I used to go from a perspective very much of like, what can the client afford for the time? And I'm trying to get more to a place of, of course, I want to be reasonable for all yeah. the clients that I serve, but also being respectful of my own time that I'm putting in and kind of Absolutely. standardizing prices. And Absolutely. That yeah. And you're also running an agency. You have um, contractors that work with you. You have other overhead costs, right? So you want to be able to serve your clients 
as well as you can, you know, 100%. So if you're not getting paid 100% for what you're worth, then it's it's really hard, right, to show up and be able to scale and, and serve more people. So really, I think charging your, your value is so valuable for your clients as well, right? Because that makes them be like, okay, I know she's getting the job done. She has the resources now to do it well and be on time and all the other things. So it just kind of puts you into that professional spot, which you already are. And like, you're amazing. And, you know, and to be able to, I love that you're, you know, really saying, okay, now I have more things as well, because I think that's also important. If you're thinking about your budgets for your clients, if you come to them and say, okay, this is what it costs, um, you know, for this type of service, and, you know, sure, there might be little variations here, but like if there's, if it's uh, due sooner or whatever like that, but at least you're starting from somewhere because if you're only billing hourly, then it's like, oh, you know what? Actually, I went way over this month because of this deadline. And then they don't have the budget kind of prepared for that. So I also think it is actually, like you said, very equitable for your clients as well when you start to streamline your, your packages. So that's awesome. Yeah. I think so too. And I also think it helps a lot with, um, you know, economies of scale. So, you know, if you can come to a client up front and say, we're going to work on six applications over this period of time, you know, they're able to get more by the time we're at the sixth application than if we were to individually contract for yeah. those applications, because I can craft um, my strategy with the first month or so in mind that I'm putting together a plan for something more boilerplate that can kind of be um, reused and shifted and augmented, as opposed to if somebody's taking me on for a one-off project, then I'm really focusing on what just specifically does that one funder yeah. um, look for. And so, you know, when, when we're um thinking about a client where we're likely to work together on more than one project throughout the year, I think it does make sense to have that conversation mm -hmm. up front. Mm -hmm. um, and I would also encourage, you know, anyone that uh, works with public entities, whether they be um, schools or quasi-governmental nonprofits or whatever it may be, um, that a lot of them are doing their budgeting this time of year. And it's okay to have those conversations up front now to plant the seeds so that they're thinking about what is my total budget for fundraising mm -hmm. in the next year um, so that they can give you a real number when you're going into the um, negotiating process and you can really come to what's mutually beneficial for both of you. I love that so much. Yeah. And I love to seeing your, your business, just your systems in place, like keep defining and growing. So you're ready to really, you know, scale so much and help so many nonprofits and schools out there that need your specific skills, right? They need you. So um, I love that so much. So if you guys are a school nonprofit um, out there and you're looking for specific funds for education and growing, you know, what we talked about today, definitely contact Kara. Um, you're at CDS Education Consulting. You're also on my website, but go ahead and let me know your website. Once again, it's uh, CDS Education Consulting LLC.com. Is that correct? It is. Awesome. And we'll have the links in the show notes, you guys, so you can click on there, find out more about Kiara, but definitely a one wonderful, fantastic grant writer. If you're looking to grow um, those types of grants specifically, that is, that's Kiara's like, that's her place, man. <laughs> That's where you'd vibe. So I love it so much. So we can go ahead and get more funding out there because it's there. It's allocated. It needs to be tapped on though. And it needs to be tapped on really soon to pull out some of these funds that were set aside from COVID, the, the COVID period. So we definitely want to tap on those and we want to expend those. Um, so that way they don't get thrown back because that's just what could happen. So we don't want that to happen. 100%. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Captured so that really well. Yeah. Thank you so much again for coming on the Grant Writing and Funding podcast and being in the Grant Professional Mentorship. I know so many people are learning from you in there as well. It's such a peer space, thank as you, you mentioned. So thank you for being such a valuable member in there and um, for sharing all your expertise as well. And I can't wait to just keep seeing your business grow and seeing all the wonderful um, nonprofits that you help and schools that you help. And I can't wait to see you reach your hundred million dollar uh, goal of bringing in grant funding. <laughs> So I'll be Thank you so much, Holly. And, you know, I really encourage anyone that's thinking about the mentorship um, to, to take advantage of it if you can make it work, because 
Um, you know, I think oftentimes grant writers are in that coaching role or that um, leadership guiding role, and we don't often find ways to um, get some coaching for ourselves. And this has really been a way to think big picture, um, build tangible skill set, and also build a community. So I've really appreciated that. And thank you so much for having me on today. Yes, you're welcome. And thanks for that that bite. That's awesome. I love it so much. All right. Well, I'll see you in the mentorship and I'll see you back inside. Uh, yeah, all the other things that we're doing here at Grant Writing and Funding. Thanks, Kara. Awesome. Thank you so much.